Well, hello and welcome to Outdoor Oklahoma. I'm Todd Craighead. Most Oklahoma anglers have heard of paddlefish and at least know a little bit about this unique fish. But I know I, for one, sometimes take them for granted and forget about the significance of this unique species. They can be found in a lot of places, stretching from Montana to Louisiana. But the paddle fishing community at large all agree that the epicenter and largest concentration of them is in Northeast Oklahoma. It amazes me to think that this one species of fish has put our state on the national and even global radar as being the absolute best place in the world to catch one. When you factor in all the expenses like food, gas, lodging, guide fees, licenses, tackle, Paddle fishing alone is easily responsible for millions pumped into our economy. Based on licenses and permit data, anglers from every state in the nation and numerous foreign countries have come to Oklahoma for a chance to snag a paddlefish. Guides every year report booking clients from not only all over the United States, but as far away as Australia and Europe. Since paddlefish feed on plankton and other microorganisms, anglers use giant barbless hooks, stout surf rods, and heavy line to snag fish. Some say it's the next best thing to deep sea fishing and maybe even better. But managing such a unique prehistoric fish species can take a tremendous amount of effort. Thankfully, the Wildlife Department has a top-notch team of dedicated biologists that are setting the standard for the entire scientific community for paddlefish research. Five zero eight nine. What we're doing today is part of our annual monitoring of paddlefish in lakes statewide. So we're on Grand Lake and this is one of the, the biggest lakes for paddlefish in Oklahoma and so that's where we put a lot of our focus. Right behind you. Male. Paddlefish is kind of a unique species and in Oklahoma it's a high profile important species. There are inherent difficulties with managing a fish like a paddlefish because they live a long time. They can live 25 or more years. Uh, they don't spawn or recruit every year and they take a long time to mature. So a female isn't going to be able to lay eggs for 10 years. And so between 10 and when she dies of old age, she may only have a couple times to spawn and that's because they, they require very spe specific river conditions to spawn and specific habitats. So that's something we call episodic recruitment. So we're really concerned with monitoring the stock. We don't wanna have to replace the stock if it is over harvested. Uh, so my job is to make sure that we're providing opportunities for anglers to catch paddlefish, but to catch them and keep them responsibly. First thing we do is check male or female. This one's female. It doesn't have the secondary characteristic of tubercles, which are little bumps on the head. Um, we will make a little incision with our Swiss Army knife right here on the dentary bone so that we can apply this uniquely coated band. 25011. 
and they're stamped do not remove and you can see as I apply it, it kind of has a little locking mechanism so we don't want anglers to just pull bands off and throw the fish back we'll measure it from the eye to the fork of the tail 973 we don't measure the rostrum it's just kind of a standard for this species with this thing I'm checking for a tiny little tag made of magnetized metal and if I found one that would indicate that this fish came from a hatchery um, it's a wild reproducing stock but we we release a small number every year so that when we do find them we can age the fish and it contributes to our known age verification research. So when anglers catch these fish with bands on them and either report it or we see it at the Paddlefish Research Center through Angler Harvest, we can then calculate what our estimated uh, population is and how many are being taken out by anglers. 1660. Ten fifty-five. We like to call paddlefish a very hardy species. They can, they seem to be able to deal with a lot of stress um, without any ill effects, both physical stress and you know temperature stress, oxygen stress. Uh, there are published studies out there that have compared them to other species, and it's really remarkable how much they can deal with. Uh, and that, that's kind of important to us because we're managing paddlefish using a catch and release two days a week. Uh, so no harvest is permitted on Monday or Friday. And it was important to us to make sure that that releasing fish is not bad for them. There's no delayed mortality. So some of these fish we're, we're pulling in our nets have wounds or scars indicating they've been hooked before and released. And in most circumstances it, it does not have a permanent effect on the livelihood of the fish. They seem to heal well, survive well, and in fact many fish have indications that they've been caught and released multiple times. So what we see right here is a, what we call a hook scar, evidence this fish has been caught and released. You can see it's kind of scar tissue, healed skin. These are very hardy fish and they can deal with most wounds and injuries. Um, we see much worse than this, but it's important that we see these guys surviving being caught and released because we use catch and release as a management tool. So on the topic of episodic recruitment, it's really interesting that in 2015 we saw really spectacular water conditions. We had a lot of flooding statewide and although that causes damage in some places, it's really good for a fish like paddlefish. Um, it, it provides opportunities for them to, to travel upstream to specific spawning habitats such as gravel, which is typically out of the water. Uh, but it also keeps the lake elevated for long enough to where those fish that hatch can settle out into nursery areas. It also uh, limits predation because it, it reduces the density. Um, so pretty much 2015 was the perfect conditions for paddlefish. So right now we are actually catching a lot of yearling fish in our nets. And our nets are designed to catch large adults. So this is a really good sign. We've had an excellent recruitment in 2015. And that's, that's really a relief for me as a manager because I know that in years to come we're going to have spectacular opportunities for anglers to catch paddlefish and I don't have to worry about anything right now. I know that we have that in the bank and that we're going to be 
utilizing that spawn for many years to come. Although it's kind of a beautiful day at the moment, we, we do all this work in winter for several reasons. Uh, we're looking for colder water temperatures. Our target is 10 degrees Celsius, and that's because about that time, these fish start staging upstream. They're kind of making preparations for spawning. Um, it's also helpful because colder temperatures means lower stress on the fish. 1067 female. Um, so I can have this fish out on the on the table for several minutes without really causing any permanent harm. It also having them congregated up here also makes it easier for us to catch them. So what we're doing is mark recapture. So we're trying to contact as many fish as possible, put bands on them with the least amount of effort. So doing it right now is a lot smarter than coming a month ago. deploy the nets at sunrise, but we don't wait until eight hours to go check them. We go out in the morning and uh, we check the nets around 9.30. And if it's got fish in it, we'll pull the fish out. So they're, not, they're only in the net a couple hours. It reduces stress. Oklahoma has a very active paddlefish management program, uh, really nothing like it in the country. Um, other state uh, fish and wildlife departments do manage paddlefish and a lot of the techniques we're doing here they are, are, are doing as well. We've actually advised some other states on some of our techniques and given them tips on how to catch paddlefish effectively. But, uh, Due to the fact that we have this unique program, which is harvest based with our row donation program, uh, we have additional responsibility to make sure that we are managing the stocks responsibly and providing those opportunities for anglers, but at the same time, not allowing them to exploit the resource. As we mentioned earlier, paddle fishing pumps millions of dollars into Oklahoma's economy. It's responsible for literally actually creating jobs. Of course, the most obvious would be the guide business. So what's it like to be a paddle fishing guide? Having spent some time around a few, I can tell you, well, it's a lot more work than you might expect. So let's trade our research boat in for a guide boat and go out with probably the most well-known and most seasoned paddlefish guide there is, Mr. Rusty Pritchard. Fish on. You want it? Okay, you want it? Can we pull out the real leaves as fast as we can? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's tough. Work. 
work out real on if he lines up. <laughs> Winds make them tough. <laughs> no, he wants to fight. <laughs> Got it. I worked for a, 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 a small uh, tackle shop back in high school. I was a sophomore in high school. We was in there talking one day about uh, catching spoonbill. And some guys overheard us talking. And they come over to me and, and uh, asked how much they'd charge to take them out fishing. And that's where it began. And that's been 22 years ago. And those, those guys have been every year since then. They've been every year 22 years in a row. I had a guy caught one right here by this dock. It was 106, three years ago. It's not from a close-up. Yeah. Makeup. She said she was bringing the makeup. <laughs> That's a good picture. That one of her. her. Yeah, she's yeah. Really good. Yeah. smiling real big. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah I'll good. send you that yeah. picture. It's only ten dollars a piece. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> last last season, I ran around two hundred trips, uh, and if you average three people per trip, uh, that's that's six hundred people that I had through the boat in six months. So. And we boated right around 1,300 spoonbill last year. The other year before we had 1,500, so that's a lot of, a lot of pulling over the side of the boat. Get these cleared out and I'll help. Good and bad. I mean, I, it's more good than it is bad. I and mean, there's days where it's tough to get get up and go in the morning time, especially when it's 12 degrees outside and, and uh, everything's froze to the ground. And, and it's, it's hard to get out and, and get motivated to do that. But once I'm out there, I'm fine. And, and you get the adrenaline going once you start hooking fish. Seeing much? Yeah, there's two on there. There's a couple on back. Let's we'll go down here by this dock. We don't see a whole lot. We'll work back to the north. They might have pulled back up there to the north side. There's some on the right. Ain't when you there? see one of those reels start dragging, and you know there's a fish on it, you gotta yell fish on as loud as you Have you ever caught one? Yeah. Oh, it's like a yeah. it dead. Yeah, I just lost the distance. back down to that way to pull it out on you. I'm gonna go ahead and hand one. There you go. Feels like a good one. Thanksgiving time, and it'll run from Thanksgiving all the way till the first part of May. I'm busy about the whole time, the whole six months. Uh, I try to take off every Monday or so in, in December, January, and February, but after that, it's every day. Uh, 
Boonville is pretty physically demanding, you know, it's, it's not going out watching the court go down. Uh, we're dragging a 14 knot hook through in the water going five mile an hour, so there is a lot of torque on that rod. And uh, these fish are big. I mean, we're averaging 25 to 35 pounds on a male, and the females will go between 40 to 50 pounds. So you have to be pretty, pretty strong to, uh, to get them in, but uh, it's worth it when you get them in. You get your drum and get them in, it'll, it'll help you out quite a bit. I love seeing people catch catch a spoonbill. I mean, 99% of the time, if they've never been spoonbill fishing, that's the biggest fish they've ever caught in their life, and probably will be the biggest fish they've ever caught in their life. They're taking a lot of people that's been saltwater fishing, and these are bigger than what they caught in the ocean. <laughs> Ooh, that's fun. Like, hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, guidance not all going out fishing every day. I mean, we, we, uh, there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff, you know, we have to book people. And, and uh, so I may be on the water for 10 hours and I get home and I have to call seven or eight people back, you know, when I get home. So sometimes I don't get in bed till 11 o'clock and we got to get up at six o'clock and do it again the next morning. And uh, it's, it's not too bad, but winter time, you know, like I said, it's cold and you don't want to get out there, but. Uh, it makes long, long days. This is a good one to end the show on. This is the biggest one we've probably caught today. We moved out here to the open water, hoping to get a real big one. But this one will do. It's probably 60 pounds or so. But I uh, hope you guys had fun on your first time to oh, spoonbill fish. We had a blast. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I think we boated seven or so, so it's been a good day. Woo! <laughs> you good see the girth on that one? Good job. <laughs> we five. <laughs> An integral part to the management of paddlefish is the law enforcement aspect. And with such a popular activity, well, our game wardens in Northeast Oklahoma can have their hands full at times. So as we close today, we're going to take a brief glimpse of what it's like to be a game warden in paddlefish country. When I first moved over here to this district about 20 years ago, there was really only about three places that they caught paddlefish and now that's expanded out to where we've got a dozen places that they catch them paddlefish regular and with the amount of people we have it's just hard to work all of it and areas like this low water dam that's really popular um, you know it's just the number of people you've got four or five game wardens trying to watch two or three hundred people at a time and the turnover just keeps happening you'll have people in and then more people coming in and then you've got bank fishermen, and then you've got all the boat fishermen. So now you've got all the people on the bank and all the people in the boats too. So it makes it a challenge to, to try to keep up with it with so many people. When, when it gets really busy, we just have to coordinate with everybody in the district and we have people kind of rotate in and out working. Um, we'll have like one crew of people that'll come over and work in the morning and another crew in the afternoon so we don't burn them up too much. Uh, but we'll we have people, mainly we sit and just watch, surveil from uh, the, across the river and bluffs and different places. And we just watch for violations and then once we see some, then we send people over to, to contact those people as they're leaving and take care of those violations that way. But it, it takes some planning with, uh, you know, where there's 17 of us in the district, uh, it's not just this spot. It's, you know, it's at Keystone, it's the Arkansas River, it's Miami City Park. Uh, all the Neosho River, you know, there's a dozen places we're trying to watch with 17 guys in our district. We've got the best paddle fishery, I think, in the United States, and uh, so we're just trying to keep it that way. Well, I hope you have a better appreciation for how fortunate we are to have such a tremendous paddlefish fishery right here in our great state. Thanks for joining us, and for all of us at your wildlife department, I'm Todd Craighead, and we'll see you right here next time on Outdoor Oklahoma.